first at four. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Hensley. First at four, Revelation Energy and its subsidiary, Black Jewel, operate mines in eastern Kentucky, and today, word is spreading that they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. WIMP's Will Puckett is in Harlan County with reaction. It was News Tuesday morning of a mining company that operates here in Cumberland and Harlan County and across eastern Kentucky was filing for bankruptcy. We reached out to the mining company who said that they do not have a comment nor that they would answer any questions but did say that they are working furiously to get their miners back to work. We talked with Harlan County Judge Executive Dan Mosley who said they have received no paperwork of impending layoffs at these mines. He said that this is most likely just a restructuring of the company as the coal industry continues to ebb and flow. The bankruptcies happen every day in corporate America. It's uh, you know just part of business. Uh, being a former banker, I've seen that a lot. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean people are headed to the unemployment line. It doesn't mean everything, the world is ending. Uh, it's, tip, it's just simply a way that people have to restructure things from time to time to be able to continue along. Now, we did reach out to the Harlan County Attorney's Office, and they did confirm that this coal company owes back taxes in Harlan County. We are working on getting those official figures, and we'll have them on WYMT.com later tonight. In Harlan County, Will Puckett, WYMT Mountain News. Revelation also operates mines in Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Well, I've seen those pop-up showers and storms really throughout the afternoon, starting earlier, and that's definitely going to continue as we head into the rest of those earlier evening hours. Let's go ahead and take you up into Interstate 64 over into Moorhead. You can see dealing with a couple of showers over there, starting to dry out a little bit. And as we look at satellite and radar, you can see those pop-up showers and storms throughout the day. Mainly areas along I-75 have been dealing with just those scattered showers and storms. So as we take a look at Pinpoint Doppler, you can see Charleston area, even up into parts of Wayne County, West Virginia, dealing with very, very heavy rain and even as we look down you'll notice that we do have actually a flash flood warning this is for parts of Pulaski County including the city of Somerset that goes until 615 this is over the past hour you can see that they've been dealing with a just a lot of rain over the past couple of hours so definitely could see some flooding in that area so just always remember to never drive through a flooded roadway that area is also under an aerial flood advisor you can see just west of Somerset that's until 715 this evening as well just the county the Pulaski County has seen just a lot of rain this afternoon as we look at those temperatures, you'll notice the areas haven't seen rain. If you're looking up into Moorhead, you guys are a little bit on the warmer side, 90 degrees. Upper 80s over into Hazard, but as we look down into the Cumberland Valley, you can see those low to really mid to upper 70s where that rain has kind of cooled them off just a little bit. But those dew points are still in the upper 60s, lower 70s for, mo for most. So it's feeling very oppressive outside and very just muggy conditions. And sadly, that continues as we head into the next couple of days. So those scatter storms really continue as we head into the rest of the the work week. Also, they do continue a little bit into that 4th of July forecast and into the weekend forecast as well. But on those days looking like a total washout. We'll break down that full forecast coming up in just a few short minutes. Steve. All right. Thank you, Paige. Two people, including a Laurel County principal, are dead following a crash last night. The coroner says 21-year-old James Dillon Johnson and 38-year-old Jamie Gilliam were the victims. Investigators say Johnson was driving down Old Way Road when he topped a small hill and struck Gilliam's van. Gilliam was the principal at Johnson Elementary School in London. She was in the car with her husband and three children, ages 14, 11, and 6. All four were sent to the hospital with serious injuries. We'll have more on the crash coming up at 6. Investigators are trying to determine what caused the sudden death of a star pitcher for the Los Angeles Angels. 27-year-old Tyler Skaggs was found unresponsive in his Texas hotel room yesterday. He posted a photo on his Instagram Sunday as he and his team prepared to play the Rangers in Arlington, Texas. Last night's game was postponed. It's important that we all kind of obviously keep them in our thoughts and prayers, but also have just the perspective of how fragile life is. Um, just really sad. Skaggs married his wife Carly just seven months ago. He was drafted by the Angels right out of the same Southern California high school where his mom was a longtime softball coach. Skaggs had been a regular in the team's starting rotation since late 2016. While lawmakers struggle to find a way to end the humanitarian migrant crisis at the southern border, protesters gathered in cities across the nation today urging President Donald Trump to release migrants now in custody. 
CBS's Natalie Brand has the latest from the White House. Say it loud, say it clear, immigrants are welcome here. From Austin, Texas to Boston and many cities in between, protesters gathered Tuesday with a message for the Trump administration. Close the the demonstrators hit the streets just one day after Congressman Joaquin Castro shot this cell phone video inside one of numerous detention centers holding migrants. We saw that the system is still broken and that people's human rights are still being abused. A new Department of Homeland Security Inspector General report out Tuesday details dangerous overcrowding conditions at several facilities in the Rio Grande Valley, some lacking access to showers and hot meals for children. A senior manager at one facility called the situation a ticking time bomb. Sir, thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Texas Senator Ted Cruz visited the southern border Monday. The responsibility for this crisis lies directly on the United States Congress, on loopholes that Congress has put in the law that are encouraging far too many people to make this arduous journey. President Trump has signed the $4.6 billion humanitarian aid package for the border approved by Congress, but the president has also threatened more deportations. So after July 4th, a lot of people are going to be brought back out. So people that come up may be here for a short while, but they're going to be going, they're going back to their countries. They go back home. President Trump did not say exactly when the apprehensions would start. Last month, the president said ICE agents were preparing to remove, quote, millions of illegal aliens but postponed the operation, giving Congress two weeks to start making changes to asylum and immigration laws. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. Democratic presidential candidate Cory Booker would virtually eliminate immigration detention if elected, his campaign said today, including ending the use of for-profit detention facilities and sharply limiting the time unaccompanied children spend in custody. World powers are trying to defuse the escalating tensions with Iran, urging Tehran to stick to the terms of the 2015 nuclear deal. Iran announced yesterday it exceeded its limit on enriched uranium stockpiles in violation of the terms. Experts say the move is seen as Iran's attempts to negotiate a new agreement that offers relief from the economic sanctions President Donald Trump reimposed after he pulled the U.S. out of that deal last year. No, no message to Iran. Uh, they know what they're doing. They know what they're playing with. And I think they're playing with fire. It would still take another year for Iran to have enough uranium to make its first nuclear weapon. The House Ways and Means Committee has filed a federal court case to get President Donald Trump's federal tax returns. The suit specifically names Treasury Department Chairman Steve Mnuchin and IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick. Committee Chairman Richard Neal first asked for the president's tax returns back in April. The Treasury Department denied his request in May. Then he issued subpoenas to both the IRS and Treasury Department. The new lawsuit cites a little-known IRS provision that gives the Ways and Means Committee and Senate Finance Committee authority to obtain tax information for legitimate legislative purposes. The growth of fuel-efficient and electric cars means Americans are paying fewer gas taxes. States which use gas taxes to pay for road repairs and public transit are raising taxes to make up for lost revenue. Thirteen states raised gas taxes yesterday. While Kentucky was not one of them, Governor Matt Bevin says while he does not like the idea of increasing the tax on gas, it would help with many needed road improvements across the state. Set over to Wall Street now on this Tuesday afternoon. The Dow closes up today more than 69 points. A 95-year-old veteran is walking across America. Ernest Andrus, who was a Navy corpsman in World War II, is walking across the country on foot for the second time. He started in St. Simons Island, Georgia, March 16th, and plans to make it through every U.S. state. How long did it take him last time to accomplish the feat? Two years. Right now, he is covering 13 miles a week and says he would be 100 by the time he is done. But Andrew says he will keep going for as long as he has to, and he is doing so with a clear purpose in mind. You should know that freedom is not free, and what it takes to keep this country free. We were called on to do our part. The generations before us all had to do their part, mm -hmm. and the future generations are probably going to have to do their part. 
You can learn more about Ernie's run at Coast to Coast, T W O, Coast to Coast Runs. Dot com. The high price of insulin across the country is forcing some families with type 1 diabetes to travel outside the United States for the life-saving drug. From 2012 to 2016, the price of insulin nearly doubled in the U.S. One group boarded a bus in Minneapolis and headed to Canada in search of affordable insulin. Insulin is cheaper in Canada, mainly because the country has public health care. This allows the government to negotiate prices with drug companies and cap prices. In the U.S., drug makers negotiate individually with private insurance companies. Is this a Democrat-Republican situation? There's Republicans who are diabetics, there's Democrats who are diabetics, and all of us struggle to afford insulin. About 7.5 million Americans rely on insulin to stay alive. Straight ahead on First at Four, it's been more than 200 years since the first regularly printed newspaper was published. Hear how one former paper boy is sharing the headlines that shaped America. And scattered storms continue for the week, but for how long? We'll break down that full forecast coming up.